Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for all that you're bringing forth this day. Thank you for your word. We receive it written in our heart. We thank you for the revelation of it. We will see it come and bring forth fruit in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated, if you would. We've been sharing with you on the subject of the Holy Spirit, and now we are talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. God wants us to understand the gifts of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. So we are to know these, we're to understand these, and he wants us to operate in them. We come down to verse 4, and it says there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. The Holy Spirit operates these different gifts. There are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. That means they're administered by the Lord Jesus. He's involved in the gifts of the Holy Spirit as well. And there's diversities of operations. These are divine energies that flow forth from the Father, but is the same God which worketh all in all. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all involved in the operation of the gifts of the Spirit. What is their purpose and what are they? They are the manifestation of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit who comes to dwell in you, He will teach you things, He will lead you and guide you. He wants to manifest Himself through you as well. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man. That's given to every one of us if we are born again and we have the Holy Spirit. What's the purpose? Not to do something in your life for you, but to profit with all, to be a vessel for God to minister through you to others. The gifts of the Spirit are to manifest in your life, to flow out to minister to others. You are to be a vessel in the service of the Lord. There are nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. They're listed here from verse 8 to 10. For one is given by the word, Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing. It's actually healings as Young's brings out. There are different gifts of healings. You might have a gift of healing in one area. Someone else may have a gift of healing in another area. By the same Spirit. To another the working of miracles or this is the, the operation of powers, the word is dunamis, powerful things that occur through you. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, diverse kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. Nine gifts of the Spirit. Now these nine gifts of the Spirit, they are in categories of revelation gifts, power gifts, and vocal gifts. It goes on in verse 11 and says, but all these worketh that one and the self same Spirit. The Holy Spirit operates them all, dividing to every man, that's to every one of us, severally as he will. That means you can have one or more gifts of the Holy Spirit operating through you. These gifts of the Holy Spirit are all by the Holy Spirit, and he divides them out to every man as he wills. Otherwise, you don't have any choice. God gives to you what gifts that he chooses to give to you for the functioning of the ministry of the Holy Spirit, the manifestation of the Holy Spirit through you. And they operate as he wills. You can't just operate them whenever you want. They're prompted by the Holy Spirit as they're coming from the Godhead, through God the Father, through Jesus, the administry of it, administering it, and through the Holy Spirit who is working this in your life. Now, the nine gifts of the Spirit, as we mentioned, they are in categories. Three of them reveal something. And we'll go over these definitions that we talked about on Wednesday night. The Word of Wisdom is a supernatural revelation by the Holy Spirit concerning the divine purpose in the mind and will of God. It is words of something that is going to happen in the future. It would be what we would consider prophecies. Prophecies that are given that are going to be manifest. That is the Word of Wisdom. The word of knowledge is a supernatural revelation by the Holy Spirit of certain facts that are present or that are, in the, that are in the present or in the past, in the mind of God, concerning people, places, or things. So the word of knowledge is facts that are in existence now or from the past about people, places, or things. So it's different from the word of wisdom. Again, this doesn't have anything to do with you having wisdom from God or knowledge from God. This is a specific word of wisdom or a word of knowledge that God gives you for a specific reason. 
A prophecy is a word of wisdom, something to the future. A word of knowledge, something that is in existence now or in the past for a particular purpose. And we'll go over that in a little bit. Discerning of spirits is the third one. That's the revelation gifts. It is supernatural insight into the spirit world to hear or see or know spirits, including angels, demons, and spirits influencing people. Now, I've had people see demons, and that's all they see, and they thought that they had the discerning of spirits. No, that's just demons manifesting themselves to you. If you have the discerning of spirits, you're going to be seeing angels as well as evil spirits, as well as being able to discern the spirits that are influencing a particular person. So this is divine, supernatural discerning of spirits to be able to hear them. Some people hear them. I've heard people say they've heard angels singing. They've heard them. They've seen them. These are all manifestations of the Holy Spirit. A second category is the power gifts. Gift of faith, which is a special supernatural faith by the Holy Spirit, enabling one to expect, sustain, or receive a miracle. It is like faith beyond your faith. The next one is working of miracles or working supernatural energies of powers operating through you. It's a supernatural intervention, the ordinary course of nature, in temporarily altering, suspending, or controlling the laws of nature, also doing powerful works in the Spirit by the Holy Spirit. Powers are released in some aspect. A third revelation or a power gift is the gifts of healings, and those are supernatural healings of disease without any natural means whatsoever. Most of the time, they are instantaneous type of manifestations of healing. Then there are three vocal gifts, and these say something. So the gift of prophecy is a supernatural utterance by the Holy Spirit given in a known tongue without human thinking, understood, not, not understood by the speaker. I mean, it is understood by the speaker and those present in the church, resulting in edification, exhortation, and comfort. So you're speaking out in a known tongue, you understand what you're saying, it's understood by the people that you're speaking to, you're, so you're speaking in your known language. It is coming from the Holy Spirit. It has no revelation in the simple gift of prophecy. It is for edification, exhortation, or comfort, or encouragement, and it will be something coming forth in line with the Word. This gift of prophecy can be mixed together with any of the other gifts. You could have a word of wisdom inside of a gift of prophecy or with it, or a word of knowledge, or maybe a g gifts that are releasing something towards bringing forth healing. These can all operate through the gift of prophecy in conjunction with it. The next one is the diverse kinds of tongues, which is a supernatural utterance by the Holy Spirit in an unknown tongue or language, never learned by the speaker and not understood by the speaker. So this is in a diverse kinds of tongues. You don't know what you're saying. You never learned it before. You're speaking forth in a tongue. The purpose of that is when you have unbelievers in your midst as a sign to the unbeliever. It is to bring forth to an unbeliever that God is in their midst speaking something supernatural. Then the next one is the interpretation of tongues. And that is not a translation of what's been said. Instead, it is a supernatural showing forth by the Holy Spirit of that which has been brought forth in tongues. It's an interpretation, not a translation of it. It has nothing to do with your human thinking whatsoever. None of these do. So this also, the interpretation of tongues, again, is not a translation. It's a showing forth. You could have a long, t uh, diverse kinds of tongues, gift of tongues, and a short interpretation or the opposite. You could have a short tongues and a long interpretation. It's not a translation. It is a showing forth of what is being said in the Spirit. Tongues and interpretation essentially equal the same as prophecy because the goal is to speak something to bring edification, exhortation, or comfort to the believers in our midst. The reason why the diverse kinds of tongues again is operational because it is a sign to the unbeliever and then it would be interpreted. I had a case, I remember a testimony of a case just on this subject of one who operated in gift of tongues and had a gift of tongues once in a service. And when he did so, then the per, another person interpreted it. And after the service, a man came up and he asked the pastor, he said, why did the one person speak 
in a particular language, I think it was the Hebrew language, and he knew the language. And then he said, and then the guy, another guy said the exact same thing in a different language in English. Otherwise, he understood what was being said. And the pastor said, well, the guy, first guy didn't know what he was saying. He was speaking supernaturally in a gift of tongues. And the second person was interpreting it in our known language. <laughs> well, that really rang his bell. He saw God was supernaturally operating in his midst. And this guy ended up getting saved, getting born again, because he saw the supernatural operation of God and someone speaking something that they didn't even know what they were speaking, yet he understood it because he happened to know that particular language that he was speaking in. So it can be used that way. Normally, you won't see tongues and interpretation used in churches unless there are unbelievers in our midst. There'd be no purpose for it because uh, if we don't have any unbelievers in our midst, it would do no, no profit to anybody because what needs to profit us is the prophecy that is coming forth what God is speaking in our known language. Now, we've talked about these nine gifts now uh, as far as what they definitions are. Verse Corinthians 12, 31 says this, covet earnestly the best gifts. You know, coveting is a bad thing in Scripture, but not when it comes concerning the gifts of the Spirit. Coveting something, or the gifts of the Spirit, is the word zeloo, which means to burn with zeal. You should burn with zeal, having a strong desire to want to operate in the best gifts. The best gifts would be the most advantageous or the most helpful at a point in time. And when it says this, this is an imperative mood verb, which means this is a command. God is commanding every one of us to burn with zeal for the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And it's to be an ongoing thing in our life. So we should want to see the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the best gifts, operating in us. And then we come down to chapter 14. In verse 1, follow after charity and desire. This is the same word, Zolo, zelo, which means to burn with zeal, desire or burn with zeal for spiritual gifts, but rather that you may prophesy. God would want us to all to be able to prophesy because when we prophesy, we're speaking forth in our known language what God wants to bring forth of spirits of edification, exhortation, or comfort in some spiritual uh, uh, words that are coming forth to, to minister to the body of Christ. And that's what you see op happen often. When it talks about this, this prophesying, again, this isn't a command to you. This is a, a statement that's a subjunctive mood, meaning that it's a conditional statement that if you have that gift of prophecy, he wants you to operate in it. If God has given you a gift of prophecy, he wants you to start functioning in it. And you can do this on an ongoing basis, is that the Holy Spirit will use you because it's a present tense, meaning ongoing. It is a conditional statement, though, rather that you may continually be prophesying. If God gives you a gift, by the way, it's not like you use it once and then you never use it again, or maybe use it every year or two, no. He's going to want you to operate in that gift pretty consistently in your life. Also, if you are operating in the gifts of the Spirit, even for even in verse 12 says, even so you, for as much as you're zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that you may excel to the edifying of the church. Notice what the purpose is. It's to edify the church. It's to build up and to minister to the church. So you want to seek to excel, to do a good job in this, to bring the building up of it. So he wants us to be effective, he wants us to be using the Holy, allowing the Holy Spirit to use us, to flow through us, to minister the things that He wants in order to build up the body of Christ. Now, in order to help activate these, praying in tongues will help you greatly because as you pray in tongues, it brings a filling of the Holy, Holy Spirit within you. The filling of the Holy Spirit is for the influence of the Holy Spirit for the service of the Lord. It will help you to get in that position for the Holy Spirit to manifest the gifts of the Holy Spirit through you. Also, praise and worship as well. So praising and worshiping, praying, praying in tongues especially, will bring a filling of the Holy Spirit, which will help see the manifestation of the gifts of the Spirit in operation. Because the more you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you're more in a position for the service of the Lord. Remember, the filling of the Holy Spirit purpose is for the service of the Lord. Another thing that we did mention, that the seven gifts 
are operational in the Old Testament period. Only two extra ones are in the New Testament, which is the gift of tongues and the interpretation of tongues, because that's once the Holy Spirit is on the inside. But the seven gifts of the other seven all operated in the Old Testament as we have begun to look at these. And we looked at the word of wisdom already. The word of wisdom, remember, is prophecies that come forth. And that would include all the messianic prophecies that were about Jesus that were, of course, fulfilled. And also all the future prophecies that haven't come to pass are words of wisdom presently today that will come to pass but haven't yet. We saw all the prophecies that Jesus had in Matthew uh, 24 and Mark 13, Luke 21 about the end time things that are going to happen. The prophecy that Paul had about many things such as the catching up to meet the Lord in the air. These ones that are in the scriptures, 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Corinthians 15, all of these are uh, the, the word of wisdom that is something future that is to come to pass. Another thing that we pointed out that we want to reiterate is that prophecies, when they come forth, they're not automatic that they're going to happen. The reason is because you could cause them not to come to pass. For instance, Here's a scripture in 1 Timothy 1.18, or let's say not do what's necessary to see them come to pass. In 1 Timothy 1.18, here is where Timothy had some prophecies regarding him over his ministry. 1 Timothy 1.18, this charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies that went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. In other words, to see the things that God said come to pass, he had to engage in warfare because the devil will try to hinder you. You must war a good warfare against Satan's attacks or hindrances trying to block the things that God wants to bring forth in your life. This is why you need to be operating in authority and using your weapons of warfare to conquer the enemy, to bind, to lose, to cast down, speak to mountains, and to stop anything that the enemy would try to do to hinder the things that God purposes to come to pass in your life. Here we see a case over in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 9. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 9. He said, for a great door and effectual is opened unto me. God opened up this door. Does that mean that there's not going to be any problems? No. There are many adversaries. The adversary will try to hinder and to block you. An example of where Paul had all these open doors and he was going to these churches and, and then wanting to go back to minister to them. He writes to the church at Thessalonica. Here in 1 Thessalonians 2.18, Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. He had to learn his authority. These are one of the earlier letters, and Satan was hindering him from coming. So even though God has given maybe a prophecy or a word or even a promise that he wants to bring to pass, that doesn't mean it's going to be automatic. The devil will try to hinder these things from coming to pass in your life. So you have to engage in spiritual warfare and conquer the enemies. Paul learned this, and he got to the place where nothing was hindering him whatsoever. We even see that very interesting in 2 Kings chapter 20. Here's a case where Hezekiah was sick unto death in verse 1. In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. The prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, came to him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. That essentially was a word of wisdom. You're going to die. So you set your house in order. So what does he do? He turned his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord. He said, oh, I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now how I've walked before thee in truth with a perfect heart. I've done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. It came to pass before Isaiah was gone out in the middle of court, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Turn again and tell Hezekiah, the captain of my people, Thus saith the Lord, the God of the David thy father, I've heard thy prayer, I've seen thy tears. Behold, I will heal thee. God changed his mind because he presented these things to him. I will heal thee. On the third day thou shalt go up into the house of the Lord. And he said, I will add unto thy days fifteen years. Now 
what was said was not going to come to pass. God changed his mind and he gave him 15 more years. I'll deliver thee and the city out of the hand of the king of Assyria and defend the city for mine own sake and for my servant David's sake. We see another case where prophecies that have been given about, uh, uh, let's say, whether it's a nation or a city, it's in um, Jonah. Chapter 3, remember Jonah was told to go to Nineveh and to preach the gospel to them. And he rebelled, ended up getting thrown overboard in the fish's belly, gets delivered when he comes to repentance. And chapter 3, verse 1, the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose, went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord, and it was a great city, three days' journey. So he enters into the city a day's journey, cries and says, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. That's judgment that was going to come upon that city. Now, does that mean that it was automatic? Not necessarily. Because Nineveh could do something in order to see a change in God's mind. The people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, put on sackcloth, from the greatest of them, even the least of them, showing repentance. The word came into the king of Nineveh. He arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him, and covered him with sackcloth, and set in ashes. He caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water, nobody, including the animals. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, cry mightily unto God. <clears throat> yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that's in their hands. It was a very violent city. And so he says, who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? God saw their works, that they turn from their evil way. When God sees change, he says God repented. He changed his mind of the evil that he said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. Meaning that anybody has a prophecy saying such and such of evil is going to happen, that doesn't mean it's going to automatically happen. <coughs> Things are subject to change. There are conditional statements oftentimes. So that's important. You know, I've heard people prophesy negative things and then, you know, they didn't come to pass because the pe people repented or cities repented, places repented, they changed their mind. So Prophecies are conditional. And then good things that are prophesied over you are not automatic. God say, oh, this is going to happen for you and all these things. Well, if you don't walk in line with the word, it's not going to automatically happen. The enemy could hinder it. You could not walk uprightly before him and hinder his blessings from coming. And he could change his mind and reverse things. So anything that is spoken is a conditional statement. And remember, when God speaks to you, there's different ways we just want to bring to your attention. He can speak to you in lots of different ways. He may speak to you through a dream. He may speak to you through a vision. He may speak to you through a word that comes to you. Isaiah 30, verse 21, Thine ear shall hear a word behind thee. This is the, saying, this is the way walk ye in it when you turn to the right hand or when you turn to the left. It's like a word that comes out of nowhere, like from behind you. You don't know where it came from, but it came from the Holy Spirit speaking something to you. Or it can come as a still, small voice. We saw that before. God will speak with a still, small voice. 1 Corinthians Kings, uh, chapter 19, verse 12. Here's where the Lord wasn't in the earthquake or in the fire, but the Lord was in the small, still voice. The still, small voice that he heard, that was the Lord speaking. And you must understand that the Holy Spirit, one of the promises is that he will show us things to come. So you should be expectant that the Holy Spirit will bring revelation to you of things to come. And these would be like words of wisdom that would come. Verse, chapter 16 in John, verse 13. Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he'll guide you into all truth. He will not speak of himself. But whatsoever you hear, he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. God will show us things to come. Now, we're going to go on into the word of knowledge that we began to talk about. The word of knowledge is not a gift of knowledge, but a word of knowledge from God. It is not insight from walking with God. 
It is not knowledge that's come from the Word of God. It has nothing to do with that. It's all a specific word of knowledge from the Holy Spirit. It's not you creating the thought in your mind. It's you receiving that from the Lord. It'll come to you with no mental operation yourself whatsoever. You'll simply receive a word of knowledge that God brings forth. Let's look at a case in the Old Testament to show an example of it. Again, these were in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 3. The asses of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. Kish said to Saul, his son, Take now one of, thy servant, of the servants that are with thee, arise and go seek the asses. Go after them. So he went after them, seeking after them, and it says down here that he found them not. He couldn't find them. We come to verse 6. He said, Behold, now there's a city, this, in this city a man of God. He's an honorable man. All that he says surely comes to pass. He was a prophet. Now let us go hither, hither peradventure. He can show us our way that we should go, because they couldn't find him. So they go and they find this one. We come to verse 15. The Lord had told Samuel in his ear a day before Saul came. Sometimes God will tell someone before even someone shows up. Before he came, saying, Tomorrow about this time, so this was a word of wisdom unto Samuel at that time. He's telling you something that's going to happen in the future. I will send thee a man out of the land of Benjamin. This was Saul. Thou shalt anoint him to be captain over my, king, my, over my people Israel. Not it was he. Did. He was coming to seek to find out where these asses were. But instead, God was going to anoint him to be the king instead. That he may save my people out of the hand of the Philistines. For I have looked upon my people because their cry is come unto me. So, this one is coming, and so we come down to verse 19. Samuel answered Saul and said, I'm the seer. Go up before me into the high place, for you shall eat with me today and tomorrow. I'll let thee go and will tell thee all that is in thine heart. And he was going to direct him on what God had called him to do. At the same time, verse 20, he says, And as for thine asses that were lost three days ago, set not thy mind on them, for they are found. So what was that? That was a word of knowledge he got from God that they'd already had been found. So it was in the past a fact. So here, Revelation, we see there was a word of wisdom to him that he was coming, and a word of knowledge, the fact that these asses had been found. We see in the New Testament an example of this over in John. Chapter 1, verse 47. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him, and saith of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. And Nathanael said unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. So he knew about him. He saw him in the past, which really was just be able to see something in the realm of the spirit. He also discerned, really a discerning of spirits was operating here, because he discerned that he had, he had no guile in him. And he said he saw him. And Jesus, that's when Nathan said, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. But here he gave a word of knowledge about the fact that this guy was under the fig tree. He'd seen him, so this was something that was in the past that was a fact in existence. We see another case over in John chapter 4. In John chapter 4, over here in verse 16, this is where the woman at the well that he met, and in verse 16, in the conversation, he said, Go, call thy husband, and come thither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband, for thou hast had five husbands. That's a word of knowledge of what happened in the past. And he whom thou now hast is not thy husband, that sayest thou truly. Otherwise, he said, you're with someone who is not your husband now. So he really told her what was what by a word of knowledge revealing uh, things that were facts in existence. Of course, that really got her. Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. He would know all these things about her. And of course, and it ends up, uh, he talks to her about many things and and the result was, she said, she knew that Messiah came. And, of course, 
He says, I that speak unto thee am he, revealing himself for who he was to her. And so she ended up leaving her water pot, went her way in the city and said to the men and all the people came out in the city to seek after him. So God used this to reach this particular one as well as to reach the whole city. There's always a purpose for the word of knowledge, for the service of the Lord. It's not so I know something about someone, no. God's only gonna tell you something if there is a reason why for service in order to minister to that person in some aspect. Here we see a case in Acts chapter five where when they were in desperate states because of the persecution and everybody had everything in common and they were selling their possessions and so everybody's needs can be met. In verse one, a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife sold a possession, kept back part of the price. They didn't want to give it all. His wife also being privy to it, brought a certain part, laid it at the apostles' feet. Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost to keep back part of the price of the land? How did he know that? He knew it by a word of knowledge. God revealed it. And of course, then the result was he ended up dying and so did his wife die because they were lying to the Holy Spirit. But he knew it by a word of knowledge. We see another case over in, in Acts chapter 10, verse 30. Cornelius said, Four days ago I was fasting to this hour. At the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing. There was an angel showed up. And he said, Cornelius, <coughs> thy prayer is heard. Thine alms are had in remembrance of the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa and call hither Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodged in the house of one Simon, a tanner by the seaside, who when he cometh shall speak unto thee. So what's he doing? He's, he has a word of knowledge, knowledge. He tells them who the guy is, where he's at, whose house he's in, and he's supposed to send men to go find him in order to bring him then so that this would be the gospel coming to, to the Gentiles. A word of knowledge was used. Revelation 2 and 3, where John gave all those messages to the churches, he told them essentially words of knowledge because God revealed to them the state of what the churches were in and then he told them how they needed to repent, and he told them if they didn't repent, this is the things that would happen to them, pronouncing the judgments would come, or else the blessings would come if they overcame. Words of knowledge are very powerful to bring things to people in order to bring them to the place of repentance in many cases. Also, words of knowledge can be, can be manifest to bring healing, where someone has a word of knowledge of a person's condition and God reveals to them somebody has cancer here, somebody has diabetes here, somebody has a pain in this particular area. And then that's the Holy Spirit bringing that forth because he wants to minister to that person's need. When we were in Ohio, we had three people in our congregation over the 28 years we were there that operated very powerfully in the word of knowledge in this aspect where God would, people would come in and the particular people would They'd have a word of knowledge and they'd raise their hand and I'd find out what it was and someone had a pain or a problem and we, I'd ask who had that particular problem and the person would raise their hand and they would come up and we would minister to them and either cast out the demons or ministering healing to them to see God bring forth freedom and liberty to them. God will use this powerfully, words of knowledge to reveal conditions that a person might have in order to minister healing to them. And the peop of course, the, those people didn't even know those people at all. They had no earthly idea. This is the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. And we've seen this. My, my wife Renee has had both of these gifts in operation at times, the word of wisdom and also the word of knowledge. She's had a word of wisdom concerning things that were to come. When before we came here, she heard the Lord say that we were painting our church building that we had back there. This is five years before we were supposed to leave. And he says, you are preparing this church to sell. I'm gonna take you someplace else. Essentially is what it was implying. Now, that was a word of wisdom showing the fact that something was going to happen. This is five, later on, five years later. And these he also gave her visions and showed her uh, the, what, he, the, what God was going to do. He was going to take us to a place in the desert where there would be water or rain in the desert and so forth. And it was all words. God gives you things 
bit by bit sometimes to show things. A word of knowledge one time that she had an operation uh, was when we were in Ohio and one of our children was not choosing the right things and she had a word of knowledge that came to her and she actually saw it. You can see it in maybe a dream or a vision, but she saw it. And she saw a pack of cigarettes hidden in the back pouch of a, of a bike. And she went right to the bike, opened it up, and there the cigarettes were. She had no idea whatsoever. God gave her a word of knowledge, caught, caught him, of course. He was in trouble, of course, took it away, and uh, you know, correction came and so forth. But to reveal things that need to be revealed. So words of knowledge can reveal things to minister in some capacity, and also as words of wisdom about things that God is going to bring forth in the future. Discerning of spirits is the third revelation gift. And this is not, first of all, the discerning of just demons only. It's not a gift of suspicion either. Well, I think I discern something about you, you know. People try to think that they discern something about so-and-so. No. It's not a gift of suspicion. It's not a means to you to discern other people's faults. Well, I, I think I see some problems in your life, you know. No. That's not the discerning of spirits whatsoever. It's not fault-finding. It's not critical. Most people think it's negative all the time, you know. <laughs> no, that's not the Lord whatsoever. That's some problem in you, thinking negative about people. Discerning of spirits is seeing or hearing or knowing about spirits that are operating in a person without any knowledge whatsoever. You have no idea about it whatsoever. It just comes to you. You might see something, see angels or demons. You might hear something in the realm of the spirit. This is to see. It can happen in lots of different ways. Here's an example. In Genesis chapter 28, here was in a dream. That Jacob had in, or in uh, verse 11. Here, he lighted upon a certain place, tarried there all night because the sun was set, took of the stones of the place, put them for his pillows, lay down in the place to sleep. He dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and top of it reached to heaven, and behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. He saw angels in the realm of the Spirit in a dream. And the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father, and the God of Isaac, the land wherein thou livest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. And thy seed will be as the dust of the earth, and spread abroad to the west and the east and north and south. In the end of thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. He had a discerning of spirits. He heard a word from the Lord. He had a word of wisdom, really a prophecy of what was going to happen through the seed, of course, which was going to be Christ. So this is a discerning of spirits, he was able to see into the realm of the spirit. Here we see another case in Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Stood above the seraphims, each one had six wings, with twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and twain he did fly, he saw all these angels, and cried and said, Holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. He saw and heard what they were doing. They were crying these things out and speaking this forth. So here again, seeing the Lord, seeing angels. By the way, if people have had a vision of Jesus or seeing Jesus, they're not really seeing him. It's just simply they're having a vision or some revelation of him that is bringing something to them. Here's a case in 2 Kings where in chapter 6, we pick up down here in verse 8. This is where the king of Syria was warring against Israel and took counsel with the servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. And the man of God said unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that thou pass not such a place, for hither the Syrians are come down. That was a word of knowledge. He was knowing what the plans were, and he was telling the king of Israel what to do. The man of God was picking this up. And he warned him and saved him there at times. Well, the heart of the king of Syria was troubled over this thing, and he said, Will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet that's in, is, is in Israel. The prophet's telling the king all these things of what your plans are, words of knowledge. He tells the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. And he said, Go and spy where he is, that I may send and fetch him. 
And I was told him, saying, Behold, he's in Dothan. Therefore he sent the hither the horses and chariots. Now, if he's getting a word of knowledge about all your plans, you think you're going to surprise him? <laughs> no way. He's going to know everything you're doing. They compassed the city, not bout. So verse 15, The servant of the man of God was risen early, gone forth. Behold, a host compassed the city, both with horses and chariots. And the servant said to him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? So we see in all these ones. He answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. What's he talking about? Verse 17, Elisha was seeing this in the spirit, but now he prays for his servant to see it. He prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes, spiritual eyes, of the young man. And he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. There wasn't just the two of them. All the angels were there. They were able to see it in the realm of the spirit. And of course, then Elijah prayed and said, Smite this people, I pray, with blindness. He smote them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. So here, he has saw in the spirit all of these angels. This is, again, seeing in the Spirit. This is discerning of spirits. We even see another case. When Stephen was being stoned, he actually had his eyes opened to the realm of the Spirit. In Isaiah, or in Acts chapter 7, verse 54, here's where he, they were all mad because of the things that he was preaching to them and calling them to repentance, and telling them the truth about what they'd done to Jesus. And verse 55, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly in the heaven, and he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. It's like the heavens were opened, and all of a sudden he could see into heaven. That was a discerning of spirits in the realm of the Spirit, being able to see in the Spirit. He said, Behold, I see the heavens open, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. That meant he was really honoring what Stephen's ministry was, because remember, he's seated at the right hand. He was stood up, though, for him. And so he saw him. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God. He said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Kneeled down, cried a loud voice, and said, Lay not the sin to their charge. And then, he, of course, he fell asleep and died. So here he saw Jesus. Again, how was he able to do this? Discerning of spirits, being able to hear or see in the realm of the spirit, God opened the, heaven, the heavens in order for him to see these things. So revelation gifts, word of wisdom, which is something that is going to happen in the future. Word of knowledge, something that is a, already a fact in existence now or in the past. Discerning of spirits, these are all revelation gifts, hearing or seeing or discerning or knowing spirits. It has nothing to do with you knowing anything about the person or about any knowledge or facts about anything. It's all supernatural by the Holy Spirit. Then we come to the power gifts. The power gifts, we have three of them. The gift of faith, we have the working of miracles, and we have the gifts of healings. We talk about the gift of faith, which is a supernatural gift to receive a miracle. It's going to be a special faith beyond your normal faith. We actually see this where a supernatural thing was done in with Daniel. Daniel. We can see it in, in two different places. Chapter 3, verse 16. This is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Here they were told that they had to bow down to the image and worship the image, otherwise they're going to be thrown into the fiery furnace. And they, their answer was, if it be so that you throw us in, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. If not, be it known unto thee, O king, we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. And of course, the result was he ended up getting thrown, cast into the burning fiery furnace, as it says there in verse 20. And they were in there and killed the ones who were sent in there, and so here they fall down in verse 23, bound in the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And then Nebuchadnezzar is astonished. He rose up in haste and spake and said to his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound in the midst of the fire? And they answered and said, King, true, O, o king. He said, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Otherwise, they were all loosed. Somebody loosed them, and they're walking in the fire. That a gift of faith certainly was an operation to see this tremendous um, manifestation of a miracle where the fire had no power upon them. 
By the way, when it says, like to a son of God, it, people think it's talking about Jesus. It's not. The reason is because the word God is plural in the Hebrew, and, or in the Aramaic, which is this is, and it doesn't mean a, the son of God. It's not in the Hebrew. It is a son of God of the gods. This is the what it says in the Aramaic. A son of God of the gods is the way it is translated correctly. Well, that means it's not talking about Jesus. It was like unto a son of the gods. Well, who would have that been? An angel. These guys are worshipers of gods and in reality it was an angel. In fact, it says down further in verse 28 where he sent, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him. An angel came and delivered him. But this is a supernatural thing that happened, certainly a gift of faith to protect them in the midst of whatever they were thrown into. Let's see the same thing happen with Daniel when he's protected in the lion's den. They cast him in the lion's den, Daniel 6, verse 16. And of course, the king said, Thy God whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. He, he even believed that he'd get delivered. Stone was brought, laid upon the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet. And of course, afterwards, that next, when he comes back, he rises in the morning, went in haste to the den of lions in verse 19, comes to the den, cries with a lamentable voice unto Daniel. The king spake and said to Daniel, O Daniel, serve the living God as thy God, whom thou servest continually able to deliver thee from the lions. And Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God has sent his angel, again it was an angel that came, and has shut the lion's mouth. He received a miracle of shutting the lion's mouth, that they have not hurt me. Of course, the reason was because of innocency was found in him, and he had done no hurt. So here is a gift of faith in operation to see this. We see another example of receiving a miraculous gift of faith to provide something. In this case, it is for supernatural provision. This is where Elijah, in 1 Kings 17, verse 2, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith that's before Jordan. It shall be, when you shall drink of the brook, I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. Do ravens come and feed people? No, but if God sends them, they will. He went and did according to the word of the Lord. He went and dwelt by the brook Cherith that is before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook, and he was sustained. The gifts of the Spirit will be important, especially when we come to the tribulation period. You may need ravens bringing you food or whatever. However, all I know is that God will operate to provide for us. Praise God. This is the gift of faith, be able to receive supernatural sustenance. Also, we see the working of miracles, which is supernatural interventions in the ordinary course of nature. We see this happening many times in the scriptures. We see it in the Old Testament, in Exodus chapter 14, here in verse 21. Here's where Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all, the, all the, that night and made the sea dry land. That's a supernatural thing that happened. Not, it, wasn't, it wasn't the ordinary course of nature. It was suspending the ordinary course of nature and causing this to happen where the waters were being held back and the sea becomes dry, the waters are divided. That was a working of miracles. We see another case over in Numbers 22. God can work miracles in all kinds of ways. Verse 27. When the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she fell down into Balaam, and Balaam's anger was kindled, smote the ass with a staff, and the, the Lord opened the mouth of the ass. They don't speak, yet he did. And he said unto Balaam, What have I done unto thee that thou hast smitten thee these three times? <laughs> so the, here he's speaking to him. And the Balaam said to the ass, Because thou hast mocked me, but there was a sword in my hand, for now I'd kill thee. The ass said to Balaam, Am not I thine ass, am thou? upon which thou hast ridden ever since I was thine unto this day. Was I ever want to do so unto thee? And he said, Nay. So he carries on a conversation with him. And he opened the eyes and, of course, saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with a sword drawn, ready to wipe him out, you know. And so here God did a supernatural thing. 
And of course, that was the discerning of spirits opening his eyes to be able to see the angel of the Lord. But here we see a dumb ass speaking, an animal speaking. We see time and time again in the Old Testament, there were all kinds of miraculous things that happened. Second Kings chapter 2, over in verse 11. Came to pass that they still went on and talked that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and the horses of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by the world, a world went into heaven. That was a supernatural thing. And then when Elisha saw it, he cried. And he was supposed to see him go up if he was going to be able to have the mantle upon him to carry out the ministry that Elijah had. He was going to get the double portion, remember? He asked for the double portion. And my father, the chariot of Israel, <clears throat> and the horsemen thereof, he saw him no more, took up his own clothes and rent him in two pieces, took up the mantle of Elijah, fell from him, and went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. And he took the mantle that fell from him and smote the waters and said, Where's the Lord God of Elijah? And when he smitten the waters, they parted thither and th hither and thither, and Elisha went over. Another miraculous thing showing the fact of the working of miracles. And we see this because there were twice as many miraculous things that Elisha did than Elijah, if you count them up. And of course, he asked for the double portion, which he was able to get if he saw him leave in that way. But we also see another case over here in 2 Kings chapter 4. Here's a certain woman. Her husband was dead. The creditor was come. Dead no money going to take the two sons to be bondmen. And Elisha says to her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me what thou hast in the house. And she said, Thine hand made not, not, not anything in the house save a pot of oil. He said, Go, borrow thee vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, empty vessels, borrow not a few. When thou come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee, upon thy sons, and shalt pour out unto all those vessels, thou shalt set aside that which is full. She went, shut the door upon her, upon her sons, brought the vessels to her, and she poured out. And it came to pass, when the vessels were full, she said to her son, Bring me yet a vessel, and there's not a vessel more, and the oil stayed. Otherwise, she kept pouring this oil, and it kept pouring and pouring and pouring and pouring. Otherwise, it was being multiplied. It did not fail. It kept pouring out. Here's another case of a working of miracle, suspending the normal, ordinary course of nature. Here's where the axe, hood, axe, uh, axe head got dropped in the water. They came, they were cutting down the wood, 2 Kings 6, 4. As one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water. Well, the axe head's going to be heavier than the water. It's going to sink to the bottom. Alas, master, for it was borrowed. The man of God said, where fell it? He showed him the place. He cut down a stick, cast it in thither, and the iron did swim. It came up to the top, and he was able to get it. That's not normal. That was suspending the normal operation of things, uh, supernatural intervention to cause that axe head to float so he would be able to get it. So we see these tremendous things. We also see, of course, there's spiritual revelation of things, but also things that actually happen. In 2 John, John that's John chapter 2, verse 7, when he filled the water pots with water, filled them to the brim, and then drew them out to the governor of the feast and became wine. Of course, we know the revelation of it is that you and I are the water pots to be filled with water, and if we get filled up to the brim, rivers of water in us, then it becomes fruitfulness, which is what wine's all about. But this, in reality, happened where it became wine. Supernatural thing, where water was turned into wine. We see another case in John chapter 6 where he fed the 5,000. Here's when they didn't have anything to eat. And they didn't, what, what were they going to do? God is a multiplier. And so we come to uh, the lad that had the five barley loaves and the two small, fish, small, small fishes. He made them sit down. There's about 5,000 people that were there. So he's got this small amount. And Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks, and he began to give it to the disciples to distribute it. What was happening? It was being multiplied continually. They took of all the loaves and the fishes, and they were all filled. He said to the disciples, gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. It was so multiplied, there was even leftover amount, 5,000 
were fed. Here we see supernatural multiplication. God is a God who will do that. We will probably see all of these miracles during the tribulation period happening in the body of Christ. These are going to be gifts of the Holy Spirit in operation for miraculous works. We also see in come, dealing with the enemy, miraculous works. Example, Acts chapter 13. Here's Elimus, the sorcerer, trying to turn away the deputy from the faith, remember? In Acts chapter 13, Paul and Saul were called by this man to hear the gospel. He was trying to turn him away, <coughs> excuse me, the deputy from the faith. Saul, filled with the Holy Spirit, and that's going to be important. If you're going to be used of the Lord, you do have to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Filling the Holy Spirit now enables the Holy Spirit to manifest himself through you. Set his eyes on him. O full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? He said, Behold, this hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And there immediately fell on my mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by hand. The judgment that got pronounced upon this man who was trying to do evil things, he couldn't see. Blindness was upon him for a season. Miraculous works. And of course, what was the purpose? Just not let the enemy stop the works of the Lord. And of course, when this guy, the deputy, saw what was done, he believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. This is the doctrine of the Lord. He wants to manifest himself in miraculous ways. This isn't just Old Testament stuff. This is New Testament. We also see the case where the Holy Spirit can do miraculous works of moving you from a place to another place without you walking. And here we see in Acts chapter 8. Here is where when he was baptizing after having preached to the Ethiopian eunuch, he said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He commanded the chariot to stand still. They went down both in the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. When they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip. He didn't walk away. He was caught away snatched away, this really literally means seized away, that the eunuch saw him no more. He went to a, took him totally to another place. And Philip was found at Azotis. It was a brand new and different city. He was, ob he was transported all from one place out there to another place. God can transport you to deliver you. We've given you the testimony in the past, but give it again where a uh, long some time back a missionary was being chased by all these uh, tri a tribe that was wanting to kill him and he got to the river and he you know they were after him and there's nothing he could do and he was praying of course and all of a sudden he's transported to the other side of the river because he couldn't cross the river it was miraculous and he got preserved he got delivered from the attacking uh, tribes that were wanting to kill him god can deliver us from things. These are supernatural miracles. They happen in the Old Testament, they happen in the New Testament time, and he hadn't changed. Remember, he says, I'm the Lord, I change not. This is why we need the gifts of the Holy Spirit in operation to see us be in a position to see these things happen. Remember, these guys were filled with the Holy Spirit. It wasn't just like God did it all of a sudden. These guys were operating in the things of the Spirit for God to function and to bring forth these miraculous works. We'll talk about the gifts of healings yet as well. The third of the power gifts. Gifts of healings are usually instantaneous, but not always. It's not involving just your own act of faith. It is going to be a supernatural healing released by the Holy Spirit manifesting out of you in some way. We see cases of this in Acts chapter 8, um, eight verse 5. 8, that is, verse 5. Philip, preaching the gospel, went down the city of Samaria, preached Christ to them. One accord, the people gave heed to the things that Philip spake, see, hearing and seeing the miracles that he did. See, in evangelists, they usually have the power gifts in operation. People that are prophets, that have a prophet call, will have the revelation gifts, word of wisdom, word of knowledge, discerning of spirits normally. Someone who's an evangelist, I'm talking about not one who says they're evangelists. We're talking about they have the ministry gift in evangelists. They will have the power gifts in operation. And Philip was an evangelist, and he had the power gifts in operation, working in miracles, 
healings, miraculous healings, a gift of faith, hearing and seeing the miracles that he did. Unclean spirits crying with loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them. Many taken with palsy that were lame were healed. Miraculous works were happening. We also see over in Acts chapter 5, this will happen. Just as in the early church, it'll happen again. This is when the ones that went forth, says in, after they'd had a prayer meeting, were filled with the Holy Spirit. And in Acts 5, the believers were more added to the Lord, multitudes, both of men and women, insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets, laid them on beds and couches, that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. This would be just a shadow. So this would be a miraculous work that would bring healing. There also came a multitude out of the cities round about in Jerusalem, bringing sick folks, them that were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed, every one. Now, this also, also implies the fact that they were doing mighty works of the Lord as well, on an ongoing basis. Many people have thought, I would just say, that this means that they were healed instantaneously. It doesn't mean that. Why? Because the word healed is in the imperfect tense. The imperfect tense means continuous ongoing action in the past that was occurring, which means, literally it says, these ones who were came, came or vexed with unclean spirit, they were being healed in an ongoing manner, every one. That would be not necessarily instantaneous, could have been from the continually casting out the demons of people being set free, but most of the time, you see, when gifts of healings are in operation, there will be instantaneous, miraculous types of works that will happen. God can operate gifts of healings. We see another case where they would even operate through articles of, uh, like handkerchiefs. Acts chapter 19, verse 11. God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. Special miracles they were. This is... Uh, powers, special powers that were operating through him. So that from his body were brought into the sick handkerchiefs or aprons. The anointing went into him for miraculous works. Diseases departed from them. Evil spirits went out of them when they were laid upon him. This is from a special anointings. These are special miracles that were occurring. This certainly would have been gifts of healings and working of miracles in order to see people be delivered of evil spirits and diseases coming out of them. Miraculous works. Now this is different from your faith. Your faith will always heal you. Don't think that you have to look and find somebody that has a gift of healing for you. Gifts of healing, when they're in operation, great. But your faith will always heal you. This is something that you must understand. You have some people that they, they, they want to find somebody who's got a gift of healing. You know, Apparently they don't want to use their faith or do whatever's necessary to see victory, or maybe they're, they don't think their faith such that they can receive. Of course, if they develop their faith and operate their faith, they can be healed. Look what it says here in Matthew 8. This is the centurion. He was just telling him, to, telling Jesus to speak the word, and his servant would be healed. He understood authority, and he spoke. Jesus said, them that followed, verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And when he come down here, do verse 13, Jesus said to the centurion, Go thy way, as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. It was his faith that brought this into manifestation. And his he, 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 servant was healed in the selfsame hour. We see another case in Matthew chapter 9. We see them all over the Gospels. We're just giving you a few, few examples. This is the woman who had the issue of blood 12 years, came behind, touched the hem of his garment. She said within herself, if I may but touch his garment, I shall be whole, receiving healing through him. Jesus turned him about. When he saw her, he said, daughter, be of comfort, thy faith. So this isn't a gift of healing. This is her faith taking hold of healing. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And the woman was made whole from that hour. So don't think that it's just a, a gift of healing has to be an operation for you to get healed. Not so. Your faith will bring forth healing. Every one of us can be healed as well as delivered through our faith. Matthew 9, verse 27. Jesus departed thence. The two blind men followed him, crying, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. 
come into the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said to him, Believe you that I'm able to do this? They said, Yea, Lord. He touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it unto you. He didn't, it wasn't Jesus' faith. It was according to your faith, be it unto you. And that's important. According to your faith, it will be unto you. Every one of us can receive healing. Every one of us can receive deliverance. Every one of us can receive the things of God through our faith. So don't think that it's always whatever God does. I mean, God operates in the gifts of the Holy Spirit and praise God for them. But don't be one to look to those. Of course, their eyes were open. Jesus straightly charged them, saying, see that no man know it. We see time and time again that miraculous healing occurred through instantaneously Jesus ministering to people continually. But we also see many times he said, your faith has made you whole. And that's what we must understand. So you use your faith to take hold of healing and to cast out the demons. If you, God happens to minister to you through another person with a gift of healing and knocks it out, praise God. That's wonderful. At the same time, he, you know, don't be relying on gifts of healing or looking for it. You rely on your faith and know that God is your source and will manifest things. And that's important. At the same time, one thing we want to point out, even if there is a gift of healing in operation, that doesn't mean that the demons are all gone. That doesn't mean that something can't return. And we'll give you this, it's a, it's a sad testimony, but it's the truth of what happened. And we've seen 22 people healed of cancer, we ministered directly to, but we had a particular woman, and this woman didn't come through. The reason was because of what happened. And this is what it was. She began, came to us, she had cancer, we were ministering deliverance to her, casting the demons out, the cancer spirits were coming out of her. It only worked with her a couple times. And there was an international evangelist that came to town who had gifts of healing and miraculous works, evangelist. He had all these gifts. And the person went to the meeting, got ministered to up on the platform, got prayed for, and was healed. And all of the disease of cancer was gone from the body. They had, she was checked out by the doctors. They could find no more evidence of the cancer in her. I said it was all gone. So she calls me up and tells me the good report. And I rejoice with her. I said, praise God for the wonderful work. We're excited about what God has done. That's great. Uh, look forward to seeing you in deliverance so we can continue to cast out the cancer spirits. Her answer was, I don't need to come for deliverance. I'm healed. I'm free. I've been checked out by the doctors. All the cancer's gone. And I said, well, that's good. At the same time, you've got to have all the cancer spirits cast out because healing is one thing and deliverance is another, and that's important to understand. They're two different things. And so she wouldn't listen, though. She thought that I didn't know what I was talking about, and she insisted that she was fine, and so we parted uh, on the phone, and that was it. Several months later, her daughter calls me back and says that the can cancer manifested in her like a vengeance and just engulfed her whole body, and she was totally blown away by what happened. How could the God, you know, God gets the blame for things, you know, how could God allow this to happen and all this kind of stuff? God didn't have anything to do with it. It was the demons that were still in her that manifested the cancer that weren't cast out. She had healing, but healing doesn't get rid of the demons necessarily. You have to cast out the demons. And the person didn't cast out the demons. They just ministered healing. It was only a gift of healing that went in and knocked out the cancer. So you've got to do both. And in this case, the daughter called up and asked, you know, what had happened? She couldn't understand. And I, I said, well, the reason is because the cancer spirits were still there. And they re-manifested the problem. And I've seen that in lots of cases where people would not continue in the, the, doing the deliverance. They got free physically. Um, you know, things, but then they wouldn't continue, or even people from deliverance that we ministered to that got free of it to a point where all the cancer was gone, but then they didn't continue to cast out the cancer spirits, and what remained worked like busy little bees to re-manifest it, and then it shows up again. And of course, in this case, the sad result was that she had, she had just engulfed her whole body, she had a faith fall, she just totally couldn't believe how this could happen because she believed that she was healed and she was physically but she didn't understand the deliverance and wouldn't receive the understanding about that and a couple of weeks later she ended up passing away unfortunately it shouldn't have happened 
But again, it's a lack of the understanding that there's a difference between casting out demons and healing. They're two different things, and you've got to deal with both. Also, one other thing we'll comment on before we stop for this morning. Raising from the dead. Raising from the dead occurred in the Word of God, and when the raising from the dead occurs, all three of these gifts will be in operation. For one, you're going to have to have a gift of faith to receive this raising from the dead. Two, you're going to have to have a gift of healing to supernaturally heal the body of all the disease that came in and whatever caused the death. And also, you're going to need a working of miracles to, of course, raise that person back unto life. So all three of these gifts will be in operation uh, when you see someone being raised from the dead. Well, God is a God who does the same. He raised people from the dead, and he wants to do the very same thing. But again, this is the gifts of the Spirit in operation. This is why we should be seeking for the gifts of the Spirit to, to operate in us. We operate our faith, but then we also want to see God flow in the gifts of the Spirit. Get filled up with the Holy Spirit. Remember what we have seen. We are to covet, and to, which means to burn with zeal for the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We've seen it again in 1 Corinthians 14, 1, desire, which means to burn with zeal. Strong desire. And remember, these are commands. This isn't a nice little suggestion to you and me. This is an imperative mood. He's commanding you and me to burn with zeal continuously for spiritual gifts to operate in our life. Well, we've seen these tremendous things, and God is going to move mightily in the end time church to, with a mighty manifestation of the glory of God, to see miraculous works will be happening in the end times. And also during the tribulation, we may see, need to see miraculous provision and sustenance and multiplication and all these kinds of things happening and necessary, and they will happen as we operate in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. First of all, but certainly we need to come in line with the scriptures. They're not going to operate just because you have a need. They're going to operate because you are operating in the Spirit, in faith, by the Holy Spirit, and you believe and yield unto Him. So the gifts of the Spirit are very powerful. We've talked about the revelation gifts, and we've talked about the power gifts. Tonight we're going to talk about the vocal gifts. We'll summarize these, and we're also going to talk about hindrances. And we're going to go through hindrances that would hinder people from operating in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, which is important. We need to eliminate those. We'll be talking about that as we go through the rest of this on the subject of the gifts of the Spirit. Now, God wants you to have the gifts of the Holy Spirit in operation. If you have received the Holy Spirit, then you have the Holy Spirit in you. And remember, as we saw in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, remember what the purpose of this is. In verse 11, or verse 7, the manifestation of the Spirit to every man to profit with all. Every man, that means every single one of us. That means that every one of us are to receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I want to lead you in a prayer for you to pray a prayer for God to give and to manifest the gifts of the Holy Spirit for you in your life. If you meet the conditions and then burn with zeal and to seek after seeing these come into manifestation. He says he's given to every man and we're commanded to have burn with zeal for them. So God would want these to come into manifestation in your life. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you. I am born again. I have received the Holy Spirit. Having the Holy Spirit within me, the manifestation of the Holy Spirit is to come forth in my life. And it is given to every man, and that includes me, to profit with all. You want gifts of the Holy Spirit to operate in me for profiting others. Right now, I thank you for giving me and manifesting in me gifts of the Holy Spirit that you purpose for me, whether it is one gift or several gifts. I receive these gifts of the Holy Spirit and I will burn with zeal 
for their operation in my life to profit others. I will get filled up with the Holy Spirit through praying in tongues, praise and worship, to be ready for the operation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I thank you for operating them in my life, for profiting with all. I thank you that I will learn to flow in these gifts, to prophesy, to operate in revelation gifts, and power gifts, and vocal gifts, so you can use me to carry out the service of the Lord. Thank you for the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for revealing unto them unto me of what ones I have, and that I will learn to manifest them and to see them flow forth in my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Praise God for prophesiers. Praise God for those that have gifts of healings. Praise God for those with revelation gifts. He's going to start operating in you. You be zealous and seek for them to manifest, for God to show you what gifts he has in you and expect that they are going to operate. Get filled up with the Holy Spirit. Burn with zeal for them. God will use you in operating in them. Father, we thank you for all you brought forth. We thank you and praise you for the manifestation of the Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit in every one of us to profit with all, including those that have heard out on the internet. We thank you and we praise you, Father, for manifesting them and using us mightily to accomplish your great and mighty manifestation of the Spirit for the, doing the works of the Lord in the service in profiting with all. Thank you for much fruit from this as we hear and do your word in Jesus' name. Amen.